All right. <clears throat> we are right at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, from wherever you might be joining us, and welcome to the webinar. We're so glad that you could join us today. Um, my name is Kayla Ripple, and I'm a principal associate with the Lundfest Ocean Program. Um, so for those of you who are less familiar with us, we're a grant-making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects and expert working groups to help meet the needs of decision makers and stakeholders. Uh, you can learn more at our website at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can sign up for our newsletter to receive updates on projects like the one you'll hear about today. Uh, my colleague, Emily Knight, is dropping a link in the chat and she will be dropping more links in the chat that are relevant to Lundfest and this project as well. Um, so keep an eye out there for any resources that we might add. Um, you can also connect with us on social media. This includes LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, in fact, we'll be live tweeting this event today. So if you'd like to interact with us there, please do so um, and use the hashtag LOP webinar. Uh, you might even get a retweet. So today we're excited to share new information on a project that is part of our grant portfolio on managing protected areas in a changing ocean. Uh, with a host of shifting ocean conditions, such as increasing temperatures, ocean acidification, and other factors, marine ecosystems are already being impacted by climate change worldwide. But there's limited guidance on how we consider these changes in the management of existing marine protected areas. So this portfolio was created to help support research and engagement that can fill knowledge gaps, create new partnerships, and spark innovative solutions for managing these areas in a changing ocean. Um, in September, we hosted a two-part webinar series, which features projects that were awarded a grant from our request for proposals that went out in 2022. Uh, Emily's dropping a link to the recordings in the chat as well, if you missed those or want to catch up on them. Um, and it's here you might be wondering, why wasn't this project included in those webinars? Uh, well, this project, the, the project being discussed here today, came to fruition before we announced that RFP in 2022. In fact, it was scoping for this project that helped us understand our role in supporting this kind of work. So for today, we're very excited to have joining us Remy Odenyo, Neawira Muthiga, and Jennifer O'Leary from the Wildlife Conservation Society, and Kyle Zawada and Joseph Mina from McCaffrey University. They'll be sharing information on a new research project to enhance climate resilience of locally managed areas in Kenya. Um, and Emily is also dropping a link to their project page if you'd like to read more. Uh, before I turn it over to the researchers to get started, just a few webinar logistics. Uh, to prevent any feedback or echoes, all attendees are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please feel free to drop your comments or other resources you think would be useful for others joining um, others on this research project or joining the webinar today. You can drop those in the chat box during the webinar. Um, we've already started sharing links to project materials in the chat, so keep an eye out there for more. Um, if you have a question for the speakers, please submit that in the question box. I'll be keeping track of those through the webinar, and at the end, I'll read questions aloud for the research team to answer. Uh, if we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up questions, please reach out to the research team members or us at Lenfest. We'd certainly love to hear from you. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded. We'll distribute the link broadly afterwards. Feel free to share this with others who may be interested or weren't able to make it today. And with that, we'll get started and I'll go ahead and turn things over to Remy. And let me stop sharing. Hey, Kayla. All right, you should be able to share your screen now, Remy. Yep. Yep, can you see my screen? I see it, but I'm seeing the um, project notes. Center. Um, Remy, maybe just click into presentation mode. Yep. Perfect. Is it good now? Yes. It's good. Thank you. 
Uh, so um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Remy Udenio, as uh, has been mentioned by Kayla, and I'm a research scientist and project coordinator for um, what we're working on here. Um, so the project that we are working on is seeking to identify optimal locations for small scale voluntary uh, uh, fisheries closures in Kenya. And um, we work in collaboratively, the Wildlife Conservation Society is working collaboratively with the Macquarie University. And it's a project funded by uh, the, the Pew Charitable uh, Trust, as well as uh, NORAD. So our presentation will have a number of sections and this will be covered by uh, different members of our team. And I'll be starting off um, by giving some background on uh, the context in Kenya, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Nawira Mudiga, who will be looking at MPAs and uh, small scale fisheries closures. Um, then we'll have Dr. Kyle Zawada talking about the research approach. And then finally, Dr. Uh, Jennifer O'Leary will uh, close off with the uh, conclusions. Yeah, so it will be a tag team. Um, just to start, off, start us off is, uh, first of all, um, we have a number of images here. And, uh, one here is a map indicating where Kenya is for those who um, might not have been to Kenya or have not really, don't know much about Kenya. Kenya is in red here in the bottom left, and you can say it's in the heart of Africa, but um, that's what I think. And you'll find that um, in this context of the project where we're looking at small scale fisheries uh, in coastal areas, um, 70, about 70% of these communities depend on uh, um, resources here in terms of uh, fishing. You can see an artisanal fisher here, they use um, gear, uh, boats like uh, canoes and those um, with sail, a few have engines. Uh, and we also have traders who also benefit from this um, um, resource, the fishery. So what you find that it's a source of well-being and you can find that uh, there's a proportion of them who get their daily income. Kenyans get their daily income from, from fisheries. So um, this is something important to uh, these communities, but there are challenges in terms of um, management. Um, there are, um, um, there's legislation on certain gear that is harmful, but we're seeing that this um, in areas that is not being enforced is causing some damage and destruction. And also the numbers of fishes has been rising. There isn't much control on that. What does this mean? There's, it has an effect of leading to declines in stock. Um, and this, this is a pattern that has been taking place uh, over, over decadal scales. And when you think of um, issues, uh, current, current issues such as uh, climate change uh, and the effect on the resource, um, um, this is all, it's interconnected and coupled. And the fact that community well-being um, is, a, is, is an issue that is related to fishery stocks and it's all declining, uh, you can be able to see that um, these things are, they're all interconnected and coupled and they're not moving in the right direction, which is, which brings us to now the question, what are we going to do? So um, the question about what you're going to do, do is, you can answer that by looking at the management tools. And I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Nyawera Nobiga to um, speak briefly about some of these management tools that we have in place, such as marine protected areas and uh, community closures. Uh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> you're okay. Good now. okay. Okay, thank you, Remy. Uh, I'll be providing a background on marine protected areas and community closures. Um, so Kenya is one of the first countries to have, uh, in Africa to have uh, implemented um, marine protected areas. The first one was in 1968, the Malindi Watamu Marine Park and Reserves. Um, there are several types, there are two main types of uh, MPAs in Kenya. Uh, these are marine parks where uh, you, 
nothing is allowed except um, <clears throat> non-extractive activities like tourism and education awareness and uh, research. And then, and that is equivalent to uh, IUCN category two. Uh, and then we also have marine reserves that allow fishing. It's supposed to be sustainable fishing. And so, uh, especially destructive um, spears like beach sand, spear, spear guns and poisons are completely prohibited. This is equivalent to IUCN uh, category six. So marine parks uh, are government managed uh, parks. It's a government agency called the Kenya Wildlife Service. The Kenya Wildlife Service is actually uh, mandated to manage all protected areas in Kenya, both marine and terrestrial. <clears throat> KWS is also the national focal agency for international and regional conventions, including the CBD, the CMS, the Ramsar, and Nairobi Convention. So we've got a fairly, fairly strong institutional uh, institutional background, uh, institutional framework for doing conservation uh, in marine and, and terrestrial. Uh, so we have. Uh, is this, is this what, so if you look, if you look at the map, you'll see that we have several protected areas along the Kenyan coast, which are actually distributed all the way from the north uh, to the south. Some of them have got marine parks and reserves adjacent to each other. For example, Malindi Watamu, for example, Mombasa Marine Park Reserve, while as others are just basically only marine reserves where they, they allow uh, restricted fish, uh, sustainable fishing. For example, up in the north, Kiunga, and down in the south, uh, Diani. So the, the MPA coverage in Kenya is only is 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 nine percent if estimated using inshore waters, and in fact, uh, most all of our MPAs are in inshore, in inshore waters. We don't have any offshore MPAs. Um, but if you calculate the area coverage based on the EEZ, it's very very low. It's less than one percent. So. So MPAs are all inshore. They have they are interlinked. Many of them are uh, coral reef uh, focused on coral reefs, but some have got mangroves and seagrass. Especially in the north, there's a lot of mangrove, uh, and, and then along the coastline, there's, there's some seagrass. So, it, so it's actually habitats that are that are interlinked. Um, in terms of effectiveness of 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 uh, of of uh, the MPAs, um, long term. Monitoring has shown that uh, the MPAs that are the marine parks that are book closures have got very high uh, biomass of coral, uh, so, excuse, excuse me, <laughs> biomass of fish. Um, the Kisite Marine Park, and uh, for example, has got up to two two thousand kilograms per hectare. But if you look at the uh, open areas, the ones that either are completely fished and have, there's no management going on, or voluntary closures. Uh, which are the community closures um, or <clears throat> areas that are that, that have got government here restricted, that is the marine reserve. You'll find that they are all below this, this key metric here, which is 500 kilograms per, per hectare, which has been shown to be the metric best used to characterize um, fishing effort. Uh, and 500 kilograms per hectare allows you to actually fish well as maintaining the ecological integrity of the, of the reef. So that's about marine protected areas. With regards to community closures, um, in 2005, uh, the Beach Management Units Regulation was signed in Kenya, and this allows communities to close areas from fishing. The first was 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 closed in 2006, called called the Kuruitu, uh, uh, closure. Uh, they are they are also called Tengefu in Kenya, T E N G A P U, which means in Kiswahili closure. Uh, uh, and and up to now, you know, we've got about nine, nine, 19 coral reef closures, and five of them are very specific for mangroves. And there's now a community down in the south that is considering uh, also seagrass closures. So so they they are expanding in place. However, they many of them are still basically paper parks. Um, they are located in areas that are more to do with maybe and, and your interest than, than community uh, than, than appropriateness of location. Uh, most of them have got limited capacity to enforce and manage, and many of them have no financial support to enforce. Them. Next. So, um, 
So community closures or tengefus um, uh, have got sort of three main key characteristics that sort of limit their effectiveness. The first is that they are not ecologically, they are not placed in ecologically optimal places. Uh, the, the optimumness or, or, or appropriateness of, of the ecology was not taken into consideration when, when uh, establishing the closures. Uh, fishing communities are also not always socially organized or financially ready to manage them. And uh, mainly, they, mo they mainly focus on coral reefs and there's not much consideration to save us or mangroves. Uh, as to their effectiveness, you can see th this plot here that uh, I can, shall I do that? You can see that um, only one of the community closures, Tengefu Wasimi, which is the one here at the top, is actually above the 500 kilograms per hectare. In fact, it's all the way up to 800, which is pretty good. All the other, all the others are below that, and many of them are so low that they are, you know basically classified as overfished. Mm -hmm. So that's the condition that they're in. So given that we have these difficulties uh, and that and that at the moment we, we see that many of the closures don't really are not effective, uh, it's really important for us to be able to uh, to to find out what are the characteristics that are limiting them and therefore this project. Uh, and here's another example of, of the change in total fish biomass. It shows that only three uh, to Kanama and Kuru are actually increasing fish biomass. Most of the others are decreasing. Kibuyuni, for example, has, has reduced fish biomass by 300%, which is a very 300 kilograms on the hectare, which is very, I know. Next. I think I'm done. Next. Okay. Yeah. So now I'll hand over to Remy to continue. Thank you, thank you, Nerea, for, for that background. Um, so I'll take us through um, the various project activities. Now we have an idea of the current status. <clears throat> when you look at a fishery and then also considering in terms of habitat and uh, how, how that is all intertwined. But what are we doing in this project? What activities do we have? Or, in place to be able to identify the optimal locations for community closures. So there are a number of approaches which we have, uh, uh, and all these approaches have activities tied to work uh, in them. Um, and what we are doing or what we've started doing in order to be able to identify these areas is to have national conversations on fish stocks um, with, uh, with, with communities and just trying to get to hear from them on their perspectives and also uh, um, um, giving them, creating some awareness on the current status in terms of the trends over time so that we can come to a common uh, understanding and try and look for solutions moving forward in terms, in terms of determining these areas. We've had those stakeholder meetings nationally with uh, 90 communities in the coastline that's one of the things we've done under the national conversation component. Another uh, useful thing that we've done is we've had uh, field experiential learning. And this we did this with a sample of uh, community members uh, from the northernmost part of the country to the southernmost part, the 30 uh, representatives as a sample. And what we did with these community members is uh, go with them to sites of different management regimes that is uh, marine protected areas, areas protected by uh, the national government. We take them to community closures, these are areas that are now uh, uh, managed uh, by the community or the LMMAs or, or small scale fisheries closures. And then you take them to a fish site. So one interesting thing that you'd find out is a majority of these fishes are in the ocean, probably on a daily basis, but very few of them have been in a site where there isn't been much uh, human pressure like a park or even a community closure. So what happens is when we go out there with them, we collect uh, uh, certain matrices um, and then we feed back together and it has been impactful. I'll talk more about this. And then we've been assessing performance of community closures by under our annual monitoring program where we look at the status of hard coral, the fish biomass, uh, actual density and other factors. Another 
key component to approach that we're going to use to, to, to look at this situation more holistically is ecological modeling, while also considering um, these important habitats, a mangrove coral and seagrass. If, if you remember from what Dr. Nero said, there's a lot of the closures we have currently are in coral reef areas with very few in mangrove. There's some that are being established in seagrass areas, but for you to be able to factor in these issues such as habitat connectivity and um, the whole ecosystem, we need to evaluate um, the integrity of these different habitats and also connectivity and identifying sources and things. And then we are also going to uh, evaluate, uh, evaluate social trade-offs and this will be in uh, a select area of a few communities to just try and test this and, and evaluate, uh, evaluate uh, trade-offs and see how we can upscale this. And we, once, you know, we'll have the modeling component, but we are also doing national surveys on governance because you might have a place that is optimal ecologically, but the communities are not really, there's no social feasibility. They're not willing to um, have this closure in their place. So we just want to see where these ecological and social feasibility aligns. In the end of this, we're hoping to have a roadmap that the government uh, can be able to use and also to plug into the national marine uh, spatial planning uh, process that is ongoing for the country. So I was telling you about experiential uh, learning, and, and this is basically a slide just talking about that in a, in a bit more detail. I won't talk uh, for too long because we have other speakers, but uh, I just wanted you to um, to see the process where we go out with the communities here. We have community members um, undertaking uh, urchin uh, density uh, surveys. Um, and once we record the, the, the matrices, it can be coral cover, urchin densities, or fish number. We record it on slates and we come and have a, a debriefing and we do it um, right after the field work on flip charts, just to try to get people thinking and trying to interpret the results using bar graphs. And because they're in different management re regimes, what happens is you find that there are different um, measures of these matrices. For example, here we have a flip chart of sea urchin and the sea urchin uh, density in a fish site is much uh, higher than in a park. So uh, th this is just one, uh, example, uh, this was done in Mombasa area. And it, it gets them thinking and asking themselves like, yeah, what does this mean for us? And some of them have been impacted in a way that when they came, before they came to the activity, they had this perception where yeah, we, we don't want this initiative of parks. They don't have parks or closures that are too close to them. So they're, they're seeing as if it would just be a hindrance, but after having that experiential learning process, they feel as if this is something that actually has some benefit or value, and it's something they'd like to take home uh, to be implemented in their community. So this is an impactful component of our project that we just wanted uh, to share. Um, next, uh, we'll be having uh, Dr. Kyle to take us through uh, the research approach. So um, uh, welcome, Kyle. Thanks, Remy. Um, yeah, hi. So I'm Kyle Zawada, and I'm going to be talking through the sort of the overall research approach that we'll be taking for this project. Um, and this is this slide deck has been de developed, and we've kind of, kind of got a broader team here at Macquarie University. So this also includes um, Dr. Joseph Miner and also Dr. Luisa Fontura. So really, as part of this, the, the research approach that we have, there are kind of these three major components, and that's the people, the ecosystems, and the climate. Now, the way that these, um, you know, we know, for example, that ecosystems for people provide a bunch of benefits. So this includes things such as food, livelihoods, culture, and tourism. But what's becoming quite clear here is that, you know, people have a negative impact on these ecosystems, and in particular through um, fishing pressure. And of course, overlaying all of this is climate change, both occurring today and into the future, that's gonna cause increased food insecurity and damage to our ecosystems. But for each of these components to sort of persist uh, and sort of be resilient into the future, there were a bunch of different requirements. So for ecosystems, we need to protect biodiversity, standing biomass, and also integrity between these ecosystems, all of which are currently sort of on a downwards trend. 
And for people, we also need to make sure that there's enough food and security, um, particularly for livelihoods as well. And of course, for climate, really the only thing we can try and do is sort of do emissions reduction. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this uh, project. But what we can do is focus on this interface here between the ecosystems and the people themselves. And there's quite clearly, you know, when we're talking about small scale closures, we're talking about this lever that we can pull. There's an action here, which is to make a decision as to where we could potentially stop fishing to actually accrue, uh, accrue benefits um, elsewhere. So with fisheries closures, we can actually get this blue line going from people back to the ecosystems by protecting some of these areas. And these include things such as connectivity, spillover and increased fish, fish reproduction output. And you can be thinking about this as sort of a broader sort of approach of ecosystem based adaptation. But then, you know, if we do this, then actually we can start sort of reversing the trends and increasing our biodiversity, standing biomass and also food and security for the people of Kenya as well. So the overall, or overall approach for us to be able to start tackling this, well, to identify these critical places to protect, where to sort of have these actions for closures, we need to understand the current state of these critical habitats, which is our, our seagrasses, mangroves and corals. We need to understand the current state of fish stocks and the fisheries. And we also need to incorporate likely trajectories for habitat under climate change, thinking about things like increasing uh, marine heat waves and sea level rise. And then finally, we need to start thinking about this as a holistic ecosystem of connected habitats, in particular to identify key source and sink areas for fish reproduction. So now I'm going to go very quickly over the modeling overview and sort of how all these pieces fit. Um, so again, as I mentioned, we're going to be running these um, sort of habitat models for corals, seagrasses and mangroves. We first need to understand where these systems are and the quality of these, these sort of different habitats to understand where we could potentially protect. And then we need to start thinking about how these um, ecosystems all connect within each other and to one another through habitat connectivity. And so this will be done by biophysical modeling. Uh, and then, of course, we need to understand fish biomass, um, maximum sustainable um, yields and all of those sorts of things, for fisheries as well. And then once we've got this information, we can then derive a bunch of additional conservation priority layers, which would include things such as current habitat future habitat under climate change, this idea of seascape integrity, so how connected are the um, habitats to one another, and also fish connectivity. So there's another uh, component to this project, which is specifically looking at genetic sampling across the Kenyan coastline to identify for what, you know, sort of one species, sort of how, how genetically related different populations are to understand connectivity from, from a sort of genetics perspective. Once we have all of this information, we then have our set of conservation biodiversity features that we can then use and actually start engaging at the stakeholder level, um, you know, sort of bringing this, these, this, this map of conservation biodiversity features for national stakeholder input to then go forward and actually start thinking about this sort of systematic planning um, approach. So just on the ecological models very briefly, so for corals and mangroves, there are existing models um, that have been for, for Kenya that have been developed um, both by WCS, Macquarie University and a bunch of other stakeholders as well, one of which is the um, regional mangrove network. And we can see just, you know, so this is some public uh, published data here on uh, mangrove exposure, so sort of how threatened are mangroves in Kenya. Um, however, we do plan on expanding on these existing models in two key areas. The first is that we will expand models to incorporate um, additional indicators of habitat quality uh, that expand past just sort of coral or mangrove presence or absence. So, for example, for the mangroves, we're planning to bring in um, sort of canopy height um, canopy density measurements using sort of spaceborne LIDAR. And then point number two is that we're going to also update our future habitat projections to include IPC, IPCC climate predictions, and this time we're also incorporating a range of plausible emission scenarios. And so, for example, again, some of this work has already been um, undertaken by colleagues at WCS. We can see here a future projected coral habitat map for 2050, something that's critical if we're going to be sort of deciding where to, where to close um, and sort of uh, protect into the future. Uh, seagrass habitat maps are also a critical missing component and will be sort of further developed in this project. There is a range of existing um, seagrass data already available in Kenya, but we do also need to undergo a more sort of spe specific mapping process. And uh, in a lot of cases, sometimes the um, uh, some of the seagrass observation data may also be kind of skewed towards coral reefs. And so what we're going to do is actually search uh, all over the coastline using remote sensing imagery. And so combining remote sensing and machine learning. And I'll just very quickly go through our um, sort of our approach for this is this is a major funded component of the project as well. So for seagrass, as mentioned, there is existing data set. There are existing data sets out there. 
Um, so what we can do is actually sort of take this existing data and then actually generate what we're calling a support layer. So how much of this evidence is all stacking up on top of each other in space? The reason that we're doing this is because we need to purchase super high resolution and relatively expensive um, satellite imagery at the 30 centimeter resolution, but we can't buy this for you know all of Kenya, um, and that would be kind of prohibitively expensive. But that's the idea. So we we derive this support layer, we purchase our high resolution imagery, and then we work with local experts um, to then actually tag this imagery with seagrass meadow areas, um, and including not just presence absence, but also trying to capture um, seagrass density from low, medium, and high. Um, and so you know that's that's one major component, and one way that we're going to be using our high resolution imagery. But of course, we want to understand where the seagrasses are across all of Kenya. But what we can actually do is through some very tricky neural networks, we can actually um, combine our high resolution imagery um, with low resolution imagery. So for example, Sentinel-2 data that is freely available goes back in time and will continue to be um, captured all over the, um, all over the region. Um, we can then actually combine both of, these uh, both of these data sets to create a model that will allow us to create downscaled imagery. So if we then actually you know, go to a new area where we don't have the high resolution imagery, we can actually downscale Sentinel-2 to get it to a higher resolution. And once we have our tagged imagery and our downscaled imagery, we then create a neural net classifier that will be able to sort of produce a spatial prediction for a Kenya-wide seagrass map. Now, how are we going to bring all of these three habitats together? Well, there's this really this idea of sort of seascape integrity. So not just the sort of connectedness between the same habitat, so between corals to corals or mangroves to mangroves, but also how these systems are connected to each other. Once we have this information, we can start sort of looking at these areas and sort of positing areas of like high integrity, high sort of um, seascape integrity versus low seascape integrity. And we can see this region in the top right, may have, you know, there's a lot of connectivity between habitats, it's very densely populated. Whereas as you go further um, down and south, you can see the integrity seems to drop off. And this is how we're gonna sort of combine this to sort of derive secondary layers for our conservation priority objectives. But of course, the other the other major component here is actually how these um, habitats are connected over sort of longer distance, medium to long distances as well. And this is where the co uh, connectivity conservation uh, concept comes in. And this is another major component of this project. And if you imagine, for example, just using coral reefs here as an example, there could be a bunch of different uh, coral reefs that are all potentially connected to one another through ocean um, ocean currents. So if you're a fish or a coral that's spawning and producing larvae, well, there's a chance that your larvae may sort of go up and actually travel over dif distances and then actually settle in a different area. What we can do with biophysical modeling and with genetics modeling as well is actually we can start identifying these different sources and sinks. This is a very key concept. So here, from a fisheries perspective, sources are sort of areas of habitat where you, all the reproductive output that occurs actually gets sort of spread out across the, the seascape. So, you know, fish will spawn and that larvae could go to one of many different areas. And then when those larvae settle there, they grow up into adults and they're actually replenishing the fish stocks there. When you think about what sinks are, sinks actually have a lot of inward connections. So that's more and more, there's multiple sort of upstream sources and actually they get bombarded with a lot of, um, uh, fish larvae, which all settle, turn into adults. You can imagine from a fisheries perspective, sinks are great because they're constantly being replenished. So these are good areas where you could potentially fish. Whereas for sources, you might want to protect these, even if they're really productive systems, you might want to actually sort of avoid harvesting there because the reproductive output is actually going to be spread out across space. And again, so this is already happening as part of this project. So we've already got some biophysical models um, up and running to identify these potential sources and sinks. So using sort of, um, the, uh, but yeah, biophysical model. But we've also got an ongoing community-led fish genetic sampling campaign where we're actually going to sort of verify this uh, biophysical model by looking at uh, by looking at sort of fish genetics and the relatedness of populations between these source and sink populations. And of course, we also want to make sure that we're incorporating local knowledge here. So knowledge of, in particular, things like fish spawning aggregations, we need to identify and know where those are. The best place we can get that information is from the people themselves. And just this mention here that for connectivity conservation, this isn't necessarily a new concept. There's a lot of published literature out there. Um, but part of the problem has been so far is there's very little in the way of translation, translational science to actually sort of um, take this concept of connectivity and put it into an applied context. And that's one of the really important, I think, things of this project is sort of testing and sort of putting your money where your mouth is in terms of this idea of connectivity, connectivity conservation and baking that into the process when you're designing these small scale uh, fisheries closures. 
I'm just going to show a very, um, just blast through a quick graphic here um, from Louise's paper from last year. So just on this, this sort of looks at that intersection. Again, remember this, this, the whole thing here is that action around where to or not um, put in a closure. There's a, that lever to pull. And this looks at that sort of lever and the consequences of that lever in relation to sources and sinks. So on our y-axis here, we've got whether or not you're a source, which means more, re more larvae leaving, or you've got sinks, which means more larvae arriving. On the x-axis here, we've got the number of inward connections. So you can imagine, you know, you may be a sink, but you may only have sort of one reef that actually supplies you versus having five or six different reefs or habitats that actually supply you um, with fisheries, that, uh, with uh, larvae there. And then with the color here, there are different conservation goals. And of course, one of the things we need to do when we're doing this um, spatial planning, we can't just go completely biodiversity or we can't go completely sustainable fisheries. We may want to create a portfolio approach that allows us to maintain biodiversity whilst also allowing for sustainable fisheries. And what the main thing I want you to focus on here really is this sort of upper left and this bottom left um, corner here, which is to say that when you have no take zones um, in sources, this really does promote sustainable fisheries, as does allowing um, sort of maybe fishing restrictions, um, you know, not quite carte blanche, but you're still sustainable, uh, sustainably harvesting from sinks, but actually that also can still promote sustainable fisheries. Um, and that's really what we're trying to get at here. And so just on the ecological modeling for fish biomass, again, uh, WCS has been doing some fantastic work with fish biomass models, uh, lifted this figure here from one of the publications uh, that came out earlier this year. So on the y-axis here, we have our maximum sustainable yield. So how much fish can you take before it starts depleting um, biomass? And then our x-axis is our target biomass. So, well, you know, if we're sort of harvesting from the environment, what biomass do we want to actually maintain? And so we can see here, there's this sort of like weird hump shape sort of relationship, and then it drops straight off. And the reason for this is obviously if you're sort of, um, if you have very low target biomass, you can't really sustainably fish from there because you're, you're constantly removing um, very little fish out of, out of the system. But actually as your target biomass increases and as you try and maintain more standing biomass in the, in the environment, your maximum sustainable yield actually goes up through, through reproduction. However, if you really want to target super high biomass, if you want to really get to like those high numbers, you simply have to actually unfit, like have zero fishing um, to, to, to hit those targets. Now, again, if we're thinking about this from a connectivity perspective, well, okay, our bottom left, we can say would be relatively unsustainable fisheries. But when we're thinking about this action point, the top hump here, this, this sort of target biomass around 25, um, that's going to be better for fisheries. And that would be great if we could identify these areas in sink populations because your sustainable yield is higher. It's a more productive environment for fisheries. Whereas if we've got these really, really strong um, source populations and source areas, really what we might want to do is target maximum biomass because that's going to really promote huge amounts of spillover and also reproductive output to other areas as well. So that's some of the science and the sort of ecological planning underneath it. But of course, what we need to do here is work with the people on the ground, uh, both at a national and local scale, and actually also put this into a sort of spatial planning framework. And I'm just going to go through that sort of very briefly here. So, of course, we've got all this different fancy modeling. We've got our ecological models, fisheries, connectivity. You know, there's this sort of you know, a whole bunch of different data and, and models that are going to come out. But ultimately, the thing to focus on is that we're going to be sort of using this information to derive our conservation priority feature map. And that kind of, you know, we, we pull that out from this existing information. Once we have this uh, conservation priority features map, we can then actually undergo a national stakeholder engagement and feedback process. Now, what this means is we can kind of sort of, you know, we, we're sort of saying, here's where we think the most important places may be to protect or where there's the most, um, you know, those sorts of things. And actually, at the national level, they may say, well, actually, that area is probably a no go or actually you've missed something here. And that becomes like a, uh, a process of feedback, because then once we've got that, we then end up with our stakeholder endorsed conservation priority feature maps that we can then take and actually go dial in and use to dial down into the local scale. And so that's exactly what the sort of second half of this project will do. So once we've undergone this, this first sort of stakeholder engagement process, what we'll do is actually dial into five or six small local areas um, where which we've identified that have, you know, sort of high potential for um, the sort of high conservation priority for establishing or sort of reconfiguring um, small small scale fisheries closures. And so we'll, we'll really dial down here. We're not going to do it nationally, but we're going to sort of create a small subset. 
And once we've got that subset, we can then actually undergo an, an initial sp uh, spatial planning process. So for example, some of you in the audience might be aware of um, sort of systematic spatial planning tools such as Marksan. We can undergo that to sort of configure our sort of initial spatial prioritization. So according to our priorities and some cost function, where do we think uh, the most important places to set up small scale fisheries closures would be? Now, of course, um, as mentioned previously, um, in the, uh, earlier in this talk, there are actually existing small scale fisheries closures as well. So there's an existing configuration. And really our hypothesis here is that by doing all of this fancy modeling and connectivity and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna ident identify different areas to close compared to what's already existing. That may or may not actually be true, um, but what we could do is take our initial spatial prioritization, take the existing configuration and identify key differences from that current um, from that current way these um, small scale fisheries are set up. So for example, if they overlap in space, fantastic, we've got a match, probably don't need to do anything there. Um, there may be certain areas which have been sort of designated as closures, but we don't necessarily think they should be. And we may posit those as being suboptimal. And of course, what we're expecting is we, we're gonna find a bunch of areas which, you know, once we take into account connectivity and seascape integrity, um, they're gonna be missing areas, places where we think you should close, which aren't currently closed. And that's the um, and so, yeah, that's a key part of this process as well. And then this is where we've got our initial configuration, but of course, what we need to make sure we're doing here is taking this to our local stakeholders with the local community and going through a cycle of engagement and feedback that we're not gonna get it right the first time. There's gonna be a bunch of stuff that we sort of can't necessarily account for straight away, things like socioeconomic re uh, realities, um, potential no-go areas where they say, well, you may say that that's a really good place to close off, but there's just zero way that's actually gonna be acceptable socially. Um, and so we undergo this cycle. Once we've gone through this cycle and iterated through this, the idea is to create a portfolio of spatial plans that incorporate this local and indigenous knowledge, whilst also taking into account socioeconomic realities. And so, you know, identifying potential no-go zones and all of that sort of stuff. Now, just again, reiterating, we're gonna do this for five to seven small, smaller communities along the coastline where we think there's high conservation priority. But then what we'll do is actually use this and take the feedback and learning from the small scale process and actually use that as part um, to inform part of the national planning. So just again, bringing this all together. So, you know, this is kind of the state of play of where we are right now. And, you know, we by incorporating things like connectivity, stakeholder engagement, habitat mapping, and all of these other components that we've, we're sort of talking about in this research approach, what we're really aiming to do is kind of help with help sort of um, configure small scale fisheries closures that will actually improve these components um, for just for the ecosystems and of course the people that use them um, and on that i will now hand over to jennifer o'leary thank you so much let me get my screen shared um just a quick check that people can see my screen kayla can i get a yes i can't see it yet Let's see it yet no Mm -mm. Okay, well, that is not ideal. Let me see what happens here. Oh, it's popping up. Something's happening. I think it's working. I am screen sharing. All right. I see it now. It looks great. Okay. Uh, cool. Are you seeing the full screen? Are you seeing um, Are you seeing um, the top with the Zoom stuff on it? I'm seeing the PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jennifer O'Leary. I'm with Wildlife Conservation Society, and I'm also a Pew Marine Fellow. Um, and sorry, let me get back to the right place. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to, you know, try to bring this all together and, and, and again, reiterate how we're integrating the ecological model with the social context. And so Kyle was just explaining that we're, you know, we're doing a, a national ecological model. We're going to do a case study on social trade-offs with a small group of five to seven beach management units. Throughout this process, we're actually engaging with all 90 plus beach management units or communities, which are spread out along the, the Kenyan coastline. Um, but uh, what we're doing in this last part of the project is we're also doing a national governance analysis. So we're going to a subset of these communities together with the Nature Conservancy, and we're evaluating three aspects of how they're organized. So first is community willingness and uh, sorry, first is social capacity. So how are they organized as a social unit? How well do they make decisions together? The second is governance and management capacity. So, so are they, do they actually have the leadership and the training and the communication? 
communication skills to come together to govern their, their resources. And the last is willingness to adopt different fisheries management metrics. And some of the some of the questions are about willingness to adopt fisheries closures, but we have a whole scale of options that we ask them about. And through this national governance analysis, what we're hoping to do is first to identify bright spots for effective co-management and governance. So look at what factors underlie success that can be replicated. And then we also want to identify need, needs that would enable a network of community closures to function. So you remember that in the beginning, Dr. Nuero was talking about the fact that we have 19 coral reef closures, but most of these are actually not producing ecological benefits. And so we really need to take the time to reflect on the social aspects of making these things work. And I see that my slides are a little bit mixed up, so this might be a little hard to follow, but down at the bottom here, I have a theoretical coastline of Kenya. The dots represent different communities in Kenya, and the arrows are pointing to communities that might come out with a different score according to our national governance assessment. So for example, there might be areas where there's really no willingness to adopt community closures and limited capacity. So that is not a community into which you wanna go and just say, let's put in a community closure. You first have to work on awareness creation and capacity building. And in fact, you may really wanna do a lot of um, experiential learning, kind of like the work that Remy talked about in the beginning when we take fishers out to marine protected areas, to community closures and to fish trees and let them see with their own eyes. There might be other places like this circle in green where there's things are actually working really well. So there's very high capacity and we see ecological function within community closures. And so in those areas, we wanna say, what are the enabling factors that can be replicated? And finally, there may be locations like in yellow that are willing, but maybe don't have the capacity. And so before you go in with a community closure, you might wanna build capacity for governance or build social capacity so that you can really create those enabling factors to allow success in this network. Um, and just in, you know, a couple concluding notes. First, that there is a Kenyan World Bank project right now that is working on a national marine spatial plan. So the, the government is coming together with many stakeholders um, to, to figure out how we really want to manage the marine space in Kenya. But the reality of the Kenyan coastline is that there's limited options for new government mandated marine protected areas in the near shore. So right along the coastline where we have all this artisanal fishing because there's really low social palatability for that. And at the same time, we maybe haven't thought as a nation around how we can strengthen this voluntary network of OECMs or voluntary community closure network. And so in this project, we're trying to bring it in at the time when the government is doing a national marine spatial plan to try to fill some information gaps around what communities want and what would ecologically make sense in terms of a voluntary network, and also to provide the communities a voice. So again, through this project, we're having five core meetings where we bring together all 90 of the coastal communities in Kenya. We actually have to break them into three groups to have conversations around what is the status of the marine space? What are we learning from the ecological model? What is What are their preferences? And we're also working with every single uh, marine government institution along the coast, as well as all the NGOs um, in preparation and after these meetings to talk about what we're learning and to kind of jointly create these products. So out of this work, we're hoping to create a policy brief and kind of what could be the beginning of a national roadmap towards having an equitable design of a voluntary closure network that considers social and ecological priorities. We're anticipating a number of publications. So there's one we're working on right now showing progress um, after about eight to 10 years of voluntary closures and looking at what has changed ecologically. We'll have a publication um, on the national governance assessment we're doing with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we'll have a publication on the connectivity model validation, a publication on social and ecological values and voluntary closure design, et cetera. But I think the big thing we're really trying to do is reverse the trend. So in the beginning, Remy showed these arrows of kind of intertwining um, fish stocks and community well-being. And what we really want to do is take a downward pointing arrow and, and turn it upwards for both the fish stocks and community, considering the things we're dealing with, like overfishing and climate change.
And we recognize that to do this, we need a management toolkit. So we're working here on a network of voluntary closures, but that alone probably is not enough. So we need to have effectively managed government MPAs and marine protected areas. We need to work on gear alternatives. For example, WCS has done a lot of work around basket traps and putting gates into them to allow the juveniles to ex escape. But we also need to work on management of all the fished areas that are outside of the closure network. So even outside of this network of voluntary closures. And so WCS is actually starting a project across the entire Western Indian Ocean on what would be the appropriate incentives to actually get people to switch out of harmful gears. And there may be other things that haven't been tried as much in this region yet, like voluntary release of undersized fish. So there's a, at the Pew Marine Fellows uh, meeting, I was talking to a fish modeler, a fisheries modeler who was telling me that if we allow fish to undergo at least two reproductive cycles, it's actually very hard to overfish them. And that this is something that especially women in coastal communities can really get behind. And so it's really hard to do this in a multi-species complex for all the fish, but you may be able to do this for some of the fish. And so the idea here is that we need an entire toolkit. And this needs to be coupled with other work that the government and, and NGOs are leading around things like alternative livelihoods and food security. And in the end, what we're really trying to do is work on a process of behavior change. And what this graph here is showing is a concept called adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity is the ability of communities or social groups to come together and to actually work together to, to, to face change. And this is change such as we're experiencing with climate change. And there are five core elements around this, and I wanna highlight each of these elements. So the first is knowledge and information. And in this project, we're doing this through experiential learning and also through all these meetings um, and engagements we're having with the, the coastal communities in Kenya to understand their values and needs. The second piece is focusing on institutions and entitlements. So how do these communities work as institutions? What are they, what, how well uh, set up are they to be able to manage these community closures? And this is part of what we're doing through the social and governance capacity um, work. The next thing you need is innovation. And this is what we're trying to do by expanding the toolbox. So thinking beyond the traditional government MPAs, thinking beyond what we've already done in Kenya by being one of the countries that's done the best in creating um, some of the first uh, voluntary community closures, but can we make this network stronger? And can we make this network a way for communities to actually experience increases in fish biomass and also have higher climate resilience? And then, of course, we need to be working towards flexible and forward um, thinking decision making and governance, and this is uh, integral to climate planning. And the final thing that this project really doesn't um, cover as much is identifying long term support net mechanisms or having an asset base. But there is really innovative work that's happening in Kenya. Um, for example, Kenya and Tanzania have been chosen by a group called the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. And WCS is the convener of a project called Miamba Yetu, where we're looking for business solutions that actually provide a return on investment, but also bring in benefits for coral reefs and coastal communities. The government of Kenya has also been really integral in creating some of the world's first blue carbon initiatives that are actually bringing finance on an annual basis back to communities for their work to protect mangrove and now seagrass ecosystems. And so we're really hoping that through this work, we're going to be able to work towards behavior change through adaptive capacity and change the setting that we're in in Kenya. And, um, and you know, really work towards contributing to the government marine spatial planning. So with that, I would love to turn it back to Pew Lundfest to coordinate the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, I really appreciate the attention to detail, but also how much you're including communities in the scientific process and also getting their feedback so that this, is, this actually has practical applications towards the end. Um, we have time for a few questions, and we did get quite a few during the presentation. Um, Jennifer, it's great that you covered the MSP process because one of the questions that we got towards the end was um, how this project ties into that entire process. Um, so thank you for explaining that to us. Um, the first question that I'll read off is focused more on the research methods. Um, so this person asks, I'm quite interested in your methodology and sampling design. Uh, when you say 90 communities, is this spread over the Kenyan coast or is it in a specific location of Kenya? 
I'm currently working on the octopus value chain for Kenya with TNC and other partners. Um, we've engaged in several locations along the Kenyan coast and noticed extreme variance between these locations from several different perspectives. Um, so maybe uh, anyone feel free to answer this, but Kyle and Remy, maybe this one's more um, for you. Let's see. Oh, okay. Um, so when, go ahead, yeah. So uh, I guess when when we when we talk about community specifically, I think I'm the one who said the 19. It's the BNUs, the beach management units. They are uh, identified and, and already identified by the fisheries department, uh, the Kenya Fisheries Fish Fish Service. So and they are distributed all along the, the Kenyan coast. They're different sizes. Uh, some of them are legally registered. Others are not, but but they're still entities. What was the other part of the question? One was, you know, what they are. Um, it was just, it was more of a comment that they're working on the octopus value chain in Kenya and that they've also been working with many communities across the coastline. Um, and they notice very different perspectives across um, the coastline. So um, probably something that you'll encounter or have already encountered in your work. Um, okay, so, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Thing. I think that's part of what we're trying to do through the national governance analysis so that we're, um, you know, really trying to look at communities across the board and, and see are there, you know, are there geographic trends, are there trends based on education or asset base, are there trends based on length of engagement with different partners like the government or NGO, and so we're trying to pull apart those factors. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question about methodology. Uh, could you expand a bit more and explain the way that you assess targeted biomass? So um, I'll take these. Um, my name's uh, Joseph Miner. Um, so this is based on a paper um, that was published recently by uh, McLanahan et al. And um, it's in marine policy. Uh, you might want to look it up. And for this paper, what we did was that we predicted biomass over space uh, using socioeconomic and environmental indicators. And basically using uh, models, we were able to look at what's the um, biomass for the targeted uh, species. Great, thank you. I'll put the reference of the paper on chat here. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks for putting that in the chat. Um, another comment, this study should have happened yesterday. Uh, what are the timelines for the project? What level of data will be available publicly apart from the peer-reviewed publications you mentioned earlier? Rami, do you want to take that? So, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so the project is basically going to be uh, to look at the feasibility of us having these uh, 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 small scale fisheries, community small scale fisheries closures in a selected location. So the time, the time scale for that is uh, about two and a half years. But then through the whole process, we'll have a roadmap that will be able to be used by others and also the tools uh, or rather the products that will come out of it in terms of the maps, the ecological maps, and also the bright spots in terms of governance can be used by other partners when they want to support communities in this uh, uh, using, who want to use this tool of, of community closures as one of their, of their tools in the toolbox. Thanks, I, I think, I think yeah. that was great. And just to add to that, you know, we're in Kenya, there's a lot of people who are trying to work on what do we do to reverse declining trends in the marine space. And I think we're all in the same boat. And so our idea on this is try to bring everybody together and have everybody's collective um, minds focus on this problem and be part of both how we develop the models and what we do with the data and then make sure that that information is also shared um, you know, with all these partners. Thank you. Um, so great presentations to the whole team. Uh, this person is keen to know how much you have already tried to sync the assessment of voluntary closures with the ongoing JCMA's development. If not already, um, how to open that link with the four assignments along the coast, or how could you open that link? Um, I mean, I'll maybe start with this and then turn it over to Remy and Yad to, 
to continue, the, the JCMA is just for people who might not live in Kenya, our joint uh, co-management areas. And so there's a government project right now. We have one in Southern Kenya where it's like seven communities were joined together because these communities actually, even though they're independent communities and independent beach management units actually share fishing grounds. So there's an initiative to like to group these together into these joint larger co-management areas. And that's why the unit that we're gonna tackle when we move into the case study is gonna be about five to seven beach management units. So the idea is that we'll identify a region that has high ecological priorities for community closures and then work at the scale of a joint co-management area. So five to seven BMUs to see how to bring those together into decision-making. So how far along the government process will be in creating the joint co-management areas when we're there I'm you know I'm not sure but it is advancing pretty rapidly and so hopefully those will align and then we'll be able to feed that information back into that initiative and maybe knew where Remy wants to add yeah I don't think that there's much more to add since we are still pretty pretty early um, in, the, in the project but it's definitely information that um, the, the joint management units would be interested in, in, in getting uh, because it'll show what weaknesses there are, you know, uh, it'll show what uh, what the ecological status is, it'll show what the, the um, resilience to climate change is, all, all that information that will be useful even at the, not only at the BMU level and the closure level, but also at the at the joint management unit level. Uh, and fishery department uh, uh, were, were there during the stakeholder uh, workshops. Uh, and so, and so they, they are aware of this project, and, uh, and also the uh, and also the NSP committee are aware. Of I don't know, Remy, whether you have anything else you'd like to add. So yeah, I'm seeing. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll try to be fast. Um, so the thing about the joint co-management areas is it's 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 a very good way of being able to use information that can come out of such a project because they have, a, they have committees and the expanse is much larger. So they might have a much greater impact. So where our project now will be of, of usefulness is when we have these products and they're making decisions, they can use this in their decision-making processes to say that here ecologically, it's been determined that it's suitable. And also in terms of social governance, we found that uh, these areas are more preferable in terms of willingness and, and social capacity. So I think will be much will be more of a, the the outputs that will come of, come out of it can be used by the joint co management areas um, in their planning processes and their decision making processes. That's that's what I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so we are at time. Do you all have time for one more question? Um, there was one that came through that I think uh, earlier on that I would like to get to. Um, so this person is interested in if there has been any thinking yet of what management tools can be used to transition voluntary closures to OECM compliant areas, or if there are any tools they that are currently being used um, that you would consider able to qualify these areas, or will this still be researched? Um, so a, a couple things is that we're actually not seeking to create new voluntary closures through this project. We're seeking to create a roadmap of where might we need these and what are the capacity needs of the communities to make these successful. Um, so that, you know, so actually creating and validating um, community closures as OECMs is a little bit outside of this project. Um, I mean, I, I hesitate to call this just research because we are doing research, but we're doing it hand in hand with every single coastal community in Kenya and all the government agencies and NGOs. And so we're, we're doing both a research process that is really intertwined with a, a social decision making process. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, once you have a community closure, how do you get it? Uh, a, a considered as an, a, an OECM in the process, I, I'm not sure that I feel qualified to answer that. Joseph, do you feel like you can tackle that? Sorry, Jennifer, which question was that? The question, the question is around if once you have a community closure, is there an official pathway to get it counted as an OECM and sort of actually get it counted towards, you know, 10% or 30% of coverage within the country? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, within the new dispensation, the GBF, um, the OECMs do count. 
um, especially if there is a management plans for them and if they there's a good governance arrangement. So yeah, definitely. Uh, but I think specifically Kenya has, uh, there, there are guidelines, IUCN guidelines on how to uh, establish an OECN or how, you know, what is, can be identified as an OECN. Uh, I don't think that the, 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 at the national level, we've actually had that conversation uh, to, to try and do that. So um, I think that, you know, it should be coming pretty soon. It's probably one of the things that will, will be done, you know, during the next process. Yeah. And and Kayla, maybe before we close, I did see one question on: Are we validating the um, the seagrass uh, imagery with field work? And I do just want to put in a plug for a different Pew project that is working with the government of Kenya, particularly with the Kenya Marine Fisheries Research Institute, to do field validation on um, seagrass locations. And maybe Joseph, if you want to make a couple comments of, about that, or Kyle. Yes, certainly. Um, and, and that's a really good question. I did put the answer on the chat, but I'll, uh, just to explain that further, the machine learning models, they tend to be very data hungry, uh, but we will combine the geotagging with some of the existing field data to develop the model, the models. Um, we, are, we are adopting a framework approach, right? We're adopting a framework approach that can be used um, as part of the that can be used in other regions or in other locations within the region as well. And what that means is that any few, any data that's collected in the future can be fed into the machine learning models to further train the model and make the models better. Um, and that's where we link with the um, with the with the project that Jennifer mentioned. Uh, they have sort of a broader regional outlook, while we're more focused on Kenya. So um, yeah, from 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 that perspective, yes, we're looking at these um, um, initially in the short term for this project, but more broadly, we're looking at a framework that can be applied widely, and that can over time, as the data becomes more available, as people go out and do the survey, the model will become the predictive ability of the model will become better. Fantastic. Um, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I just want to say thank you again to all of our speakers. Wonderful presentation. Uh, for those of you who are attending and to your question didn't get answered, or if you have more questions, please do follow up with us. Um, we can connect you with the research team. Um, you can uh, connect the with the research team directly. We'll be sending out a follow-up email with our contact information. So please do reach out. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you again and have a great day or great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.